We're glad that you're here. How many's had a rough week? You say, I've had a rough week. You ever have some of those weeks you just feel like you've been picked on and picked on? Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, Judges, the sixth chapter and the seventh chapter today. And uh, we find there that uh, Gideon was kind of that way. He, the children of Israel just felt like they couldn't take anymore. How many's ever heard that story about the coward of the county? The song? And uh, I love that part in there where they're in a, I don't know, a bar or somewhere there in some uh, building there. And this guy that's been picked on all over the county all this time, uh, you know, they're making fun of him again. And he turns and they go, yeah, run on out, coward, run on out. And he goes over and he goes to the door. And, and they, when, right when he gets to the door, he reaches down to the door and he locks the door. Then he turns around and whips everybody in the room. I love stories like that. You know, the underdog. And that's kind of what Judge is about is the unlikely, unlikely heroes. You know, sometimes we find ourselves in situations where being at the end of the rope is a, kind of a neat place to be. You've heard of uh, mama bears. Uh, you know, they, some people go, you don't mess with my kid because I'm like a mama bear. You know, you can go out in the woods and most of the time a bear will run from you unless you get between her and her cub. And sometimes we find ourselves in those situations. I've seen some women in this church. They're not very mean until somebody starts messing with their kid. Then they can get mean in a hurry. And uh, sometimes we're, we go through situations and we don't find, we don't know the strength that we really have until something stirs that up. And that's kind of like the story today in Judges, the sixth chapter. And it said, again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So it wasn't their first time. We find out for seven years they've been doing evil in the eyes of God. For seven years he gave them into the hands. Uh, after seven years of doing evil and doing wrong, God gave them into the hands of the Midianites. So does God sometimes allow us to be put in situations where we're more apt to be... Uh, go through stuff and have hardships. Yes, he does. When we become disobedient and we won't listen to God anymore, uh, sometimes God allows us, you want to go on your own way? You don't want to listen to me? Well, I'll let you. And you will find out what it's like going your way instead of my way. And so he said, because of the power of the Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain cliffs, caves, and strongholds. So they were really afraid of these Midianites and the uh, the Amorites. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites and the Amorites and other eastern people invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing. For Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkey. They came up with their livestock and their tents and they were like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count the men and their camels. They invaded the land and ravaged it. Midian so impoverished Israelites that they cried out to the Lord. What will it take for you and I to cry out to the Lord? Where in our life does God have to lift his hand of protection and allow us to be made vulnerable for us to really cry out to the Lord? That's the question I think we need to ask. It says here, when the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet. Some of you may have come today and you've got a real need or you've got a real need in your family. You know, you, you've got a need. Uh, and what I need today, I need deliverance. I need God to heal or I need God to deliver or I need God to turn my child around or I need God to, uh, to help me financially. I need, that's what I need. That's what I need but you're just going to give me a sermon. And so the Israelites, it's like, we don't need a prophet. What we need is a deliverer. He sent them a prophet. A prophet's kind of a truth teller. He'll tell you the truth when you don't even want to hear it. And the prophet, he said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I now listen to the, all the eyes in this. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I snatched you from the power of Egypt and from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them from before you. 
I gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship other gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you would not listen to me. He said, you wouldn't listen. So the trouble that you're in is kind of your own fault. I tried to tell you, but you would not listen. I tried to get through to you, but you would not listen. For seven years, I've been patiently waiting for you to turn, but you haven't turned. Matter of fact, during this time, not only have you not turned, but you've taken on other gods of this world. And we find in verse 11, the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak of Oprah, and it belonged to Joash and Abrazorite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in the winepress to keep it from the Midianites. So you got to get this idea. Normally they went up on a hill and they'd throw the wheat up in the air and the shaft would blow out with the wind and they would keep the, the good part. Well, this, you find Gideon, he's not out there where he should be. He's down, basically they'd done this on a lower part of a valley or near a, a, a cave or a mountainside. They would go down here and it was a real low place. It was a rock place and that's where they, the, the wine press was. And it was a low place. Well, the reason he was doing this in the low place is the uh, Amorites and the uh, Mennonites, they had made it a policy when they could look down and they could see them preparing the crops. You know, they were now fixing to uh, move the shaft from the wheat. They're fixing to harvest it in where the people could have their food. At this time, that's when they attacked. You know, the enemy... He'll let you plant and he'll let you water and he'll let you prepare. But when it comes harvest time, that's when the enemy wants to come and take your crop. You know, you, you raise your children and you do this for them and do that. And about the time they get to a certain age, the devil wants to take them. He wants to destroy them. And so this was what's happening. Every year at harvest time, the enemy would come in and steal their crops. There's another story over in uh, 2 Samuel's writing the, uh, uh, the 23rd chapter, I think it is, and the uh, 11th and 12th verse, there, this, this is not a new game. It's something, there was a guy named Shammoth. He was one of David's mighty men. Now, David's mighty men, one of David's men was known for killing 800 people by himself. That's a mighty man right there. And there's another one that killed 300 by himself. And they told about killing beastly looking men that look like bears and lions in that same passage. But one time this enemy kept coming down and every time they were, he, uh, you, there's a guy named Shemeth. He went out and he stood in his lentil patch, which we would know that is a pea patch. I don't know if it's purple hull, hull peas or black eyed peas or whatever, but he had a pea patch. And they got sick and tired of every time that they got the harvest ready, every time they were fixing to gather in the harvest and there was going to be food on their table and it was going to be for them, the enemy would come and yank it away from them. And Shammoth had enough. He was sick and tired of being sick and tired and he went out there and he stood in the middle of his, his pea patch and said, bring it on. And some kind of supernatural power came over Shammoth. And Shammoth defended all of his enemies against this, uh, against his enemy at that time, which was the Philistines. And, you know, can you imagine them going back home? They go, well, we got food ready here. I mean, we got this, we got that. Where's the peas at? Well, uh, there's something happened. Well, what happened? There was a man, a man not an army, a man standing in the field with his sword and he would not let us take his peas. Isn't that an amazing story? But Shammoth stood his ground in his pea patch, said, you're not gonna take my peas no more. I really feel like that we're at a turning point in our country, we're at a turning point in families, we're at a turning point in schools, we're at a turning point in government because I think some people are so sick and tired, they're saying we're not gonna take it anymore. We're not going to take it no more. And you know, the first person that you need to do, he said, our, our enemy is not flesh and blood. So the real one that we need to come again is Satan himself. Did you know Satan's MO 
uh, Satan, the Bible said, here's what he comes to do. The Bible tells us about Satan. He said he's come to kill, steal, and destroy. That's all he's interested in. And either God is your Lord or the devil's your Lord. And the devil, he has no other intentions but to come to steal, kill, and destroy. You go through all the way through the Bible and you'll find out that's what he's always doing to God's people. He's always still in their harvest. He's always coming against his people. He's always doing something to devour them, to destroy them. Well, so they, they wanted a deliverer and God sent them a prophet. And the reason for this is sometimes before there can be an outward deliverance, they need to be an inter, inner deliverance. See, their problem was not really the Amorites, really wasn't the Mennonites, the Mennonites. That was not their real problem. Their real problems, their real problem was that their heart was wrong. Their heart, they had idols. It wasn't the Mennonites and the Amorites. It was that they, they had a problem in their heart. And God sent a prophet because he wanted to get their heart right where he could bless them again. Are we at a state in our own lives where we're blessable or we're unblessable? God said, I ain't gonna bless that. I'm not gonna bless you while you're serving another God. I'm not gonna bless that when you're following other ways. I'm not gonna do it. And so God sent them. And so when God allows stuff to come against us, he hasn't done it to put us down. He's done it to turn us around. God's done it to turn it around. He'll put so much pressure on you until you turn around. Why? Because he loves you that much. And so if you're under more pressure and you know what to do with, you may need to ask him, am I listening to God? Verse 11, the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak tree there. Oak belonged to them. And, we, you know, we find him at the wine press there. Verse 13, but Sir Gideon replied, if the Lord with, is with us, if the Lord is with us. Isn't that one of the first things that we do when we find ourselves in, in a fix? We say, well, you know, if the Lord would have been with me, if the Lord was with me. What would you do in your life today? What would you really accomplish if you knew the Lord was with you? If you really knew the Lord was with you. And so Gideon is saying, well, if the Lord is with us, then why has all this happened to us? Do you see the, who they're blaming there? They're blaming God. God, if you'd have been with us, all this wouldn't happen. Why do why'd you let this happen to us? And where's God to start with? We've got a nation right now that's almost turned their back completely on God, and then they're wondering why we're having all these problems. And I'm going to tell you, there's not a political party that's going to fix this. There's a God Almighty, the only one that can fix it. And he's not going to fix it until we turn back to him. Until we turn back to him. And they said, where are all the wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us in the hand of Midian. Has God abandoned us or have we abandoned God? That was the real question there. Who, who left who? Like this two man and woman driving down the road in, in the truck and the husband, said, you know, the wife said, honey, you remember when we first got married? And he said, yeah. You remember when we used to sit right close together and hold hands even when you was driving? And, and he said, yes. And she said, why don't we do it anymore? He said, who moved? He's still driving. Who moved? And so if we don't feel that God is close, who moved? If you don't feel that God is with you, then Who moved? What's going on? Why is it like that? The Bible says, draw nigh to me and I'll draw nigh to you. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? But the Lord Gideon asked, how can I save Israel? He said, uh, by, he said, I am, how can I save Israel? Uh, how can I save us Midian's, against Midian's hand? Am I not sending you? But the Lord Gideon asked, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manassas and I am the least of my family. And so we find when the angel first comes to, uh, first comes to Gideon, he says, oh, mighty warrior. 
You know, if you was in a stage play, that would be where everybody in the crowd was laughing like as a joke, like mighty warrior, you're hiding, you're hiding down here. You know, you're trying to take care of the wheat down here in a, pretty much of a cave. And, you know, so you're hiding from, from God. You're not, don't sound like a mighty warrior to me. But see, here's the way you can tell the difference between God's voice and Satan's voice. When the devil comes, he will whisper in your ear where you, what you are. And he'll whisper your failures and your inadequacies. The devil always starts where you're at. He'll go, you're no good. Your family's no good. You're never going to amount to anything. Your family's never amounted to anything. You're never going to be nothing. You know, it's, and you know, you're not even in a place where, you know, God can use you. You're not in a place, God's not going to answer your prayer requests. And that's kind of the way, that's the devil's voice. If we were listening to God's voice, we would know that he's with us. You go, well, I ain't been the greatest person. But he said, while we were yet sinners, he was blessing and helping us. You know, he died for us while we were yet sinners. But there will be times if God loves you, he will discipline you. If God loves you, he will bring, allow things to come against you to allow that to turn you back to him. Because he knows the only person that really cares about you is him. So he will use things to turn you. And so uh, he, he's trying to convince uh, Gideon and Gideon goes but God I'm we've got the least clan of Israel and you know my family's the least family and I'm the least person in the family why would you come to me here's the thing you need to know about God if 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 truly God uses our weakness and he makes us strong then our weakness is not our weakness is an asset, not a disability. Our weakness is what God's looking for. Because when we're weak, then God is strong. When, when we're weak, God is strong. That's what God's wanting us to see and understand. Here's how faith works. God reveals a little and you take a step. But see, we want God to show us the whole thing. God doesn't do that. He just gives you one step. Thy word is like a lamp unto my foot. Well, God, I don't want just a lamp. I, you know, those little lamps were just little bitty, you know, little bitty small clay. You can only see about a foot in front of you. That's the way God works. God's going to show you one little foot and you take that step. Then he's going to show you you take another step. But we want the whole God tell us, show us everything. God says, I'm not going to do it. You're going to walk by faith with me. So here's how faith works. God reveals a little, you take a step. God reveals a little more, you take another step. Scripture says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. This is the thing when you learn about God. God, Gideon's whole life can be summarized as this. I am weak, but he is strong. Gideon was the weakest clan. He was the weakest the family. He was the weakest one in the family. That's exactly who God wanted to use. Your weakness is an asset to God because if you don't have anything else to lean on, you'll lean on God. God normally comes and picks people at their weakest point to do great things in it. You look over and over in the Bible, God finds people in their weakest state, and that's the person God uses. We're going to find that's true in the, in the story of Gideon and his army. The other thing, it is better to be with Jesus facing the most impossible army all by yourself than to have the massive army on your side without Jesus. I'd rather, I'd rather fight a giant army with Jesus than fight one person without him. That's how important it is to rely on Jesus. The mature Christian knows Jesus plus nothing is everything. Jesus plus nothing is everything in the mature Christian life. That's who, that's who all, that's who we depend on. That's who we trust in. Christianity, even the beginning of Christianity begins with, I'm not righteous enough to save myself. That's, that's how you, we, people normally come to Jesus Christ is, you know, Lord, I, I, I'll, I'll never be righteous. I'll never be saved. There's no good in me. And so I come and I'm leaning on your righteousness. If, if I'm not saved by your righteousness, I'll not be saved at all. And that's true. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. And so it, it, it continues every day of your, for the rest of your life. I need God's power for every good thing in my life. Every single day, you're going to need God. And God's never going to let you get out of that point that you're not dependent upon him. That's, he wants to put you in a place of dependence because that's your greatest place. You're going to see that here in just a moment. And so the Lord... God told him, I'm going to send you anyway. But the Lord, Gideon asked, how can I save Israel? 
tells about how weak he is. Gideon replied, if now I found favor in your eyes, give me a sign. Now, he still wants a sign, even though this angel is standing before him telling him that God is with him. I get it. One time I, I had a vision from the Lord. I don't know if you believe in it. and I, It doesn't really matter if you believe it or not, but I had a vision from the Lord. I wrote it all down in great detail in a prayer diary, and I put it away, and it seemed to, uh, it seemed to be, you know, like I was the unlikely hero in a situation, and I wasn't even going to tell anybody about it. I, you may not know, but I'm kind of a shy, introverted type person. I still get butterflies when I come to preach, and when I do things before people. It's just my nature. I was born with a speech impediment. And, you know, God was telling me that I'm going to use you. And I'm saying, well, how, how are you going to use me? I can't even speak. People can't even understand me. I went to a tent revival, and this guy was talking about healing. And, you know, I said, well, I'll go up for prayer. And he, he said, little boy, do you believe that God can heal you? And I said, well, yeah, I guess. I mean, I heard you preaching about it. And, uh, and he laid hands on me and he prayed for me and he prayed that God would heal me and instantly I was healed. And he said, one day you will, you will t teach and preach my word just like I'm doing. And so I've had those instances in, the Bible, uh, in my own life where things like that have happened. But when I got this vision, I wrote it down. I didn't tell anybody. And one day we were going through Knoxville. I was pastoring over Knoxville and I went by this church and they were having a revival. I'd never been to the church, didn't know the pastor there, didn't know the evangelist. Had an evangelist. When I went in and, and sat down, the evangelist, he come to the pulpit and when it was turned over to him and he right at the very beginning of the service, he said, I'd like for the man back there in the blue suit, I'd like for you to stand. And I was looking, it was me. He said, today when I was in the hotel, I was praying and God showed me that you would be here tonight and God wanted me to tell you this. He said, you've had a vision from the Lord and you've been questioning, you've been wondering, was that from God or not? The other thing is, you, you, you don't know if it is. And he said, I'm here to tell you, God wants me to tell you that that was from God and you can depend on it and you can count on it. It's going to happen. Well, it meant that we was going to be selling out everything we own. We was going to move to another location. We're starting a whole different ministry. And instead of preaching to like 30 people on Sunday morning, I'm going to be preaching to three, 4,000 people. And I'm like, how can this happen? I'm, not, I'm like the littlest pastor in the state. I got the, probably the littlest congregation. And I'm a nobody from nowhere. But see, when God, God done that, I'll tell you, when I first had to begin to speak to larger crowds, I would, I would get, God would just have to come over me and I would speak. I'd be so nervous and uh, I would just, something would come over me and I could just do it. And when it was over, I would look back and literally I would be like sick for like a week. It's like, oh my God, it took every ounce of energy that I ever had in me. And I just like, okay, after we have these big meetings like this, I'm going somewhere for a couple of days because I can't take it. It's all, I'm told, I'm telling you the truth. But God looks for your weakness because your weakness is where he looks for people that are weak, that will obey his voice because he knows if they obey him in their weakness, they will depend on him. Almost every staff person that I'm using today, it's come down to this. I said, I feel like God wants you to speak God's word. I want you to come up here and speak with me. Almost every one of the staff can't do that. That's almost their first clue. I can't do that. I go, well, I know I got the right one. I know I got the right one. God will always ask you to do something bigger than you are, more unbelievable than you can imagine. God will cause you to confront bigger devils and bigger issues than you ever thought you were capable of doing. Why? Because if you will obey his voice, he knows you'll come and you'll come with complete dependence upon him. That's what it takes is complete dependence on him. We can't make it any other way. And so here he is, an angel of the Lord, which we find out later that's a theo theophanous, uh, uh, I'm not saying that right, Christophanous, that's where Jesus Christ, before he was Mary's baby in the Trinity, Jesus came to people and they presumed it was an angel of the Lord, but it was actually the Lord himself, Jesus Christ. So, Gideon finally gets the fact that he's talking to the Lord. The Lord, he said, the Lord even showed me his face. And, uh, and he says, if, 
now I've found favor in your eyes. Give me a sign. So Gideon's still wanting a sign. I kind of get it. God, I know you're real and I know you're God, but I don't know really if you can work with me because I'm nobody to be worked with. And so Gideon prepared a meal, a young goat and from the ephah of uh, uh, flour and made bread without yeast, putting meat in, in a basket and broth in a pot. He brought them out and offered them under an oak. The angel of God said to him, take the meat and unleavened bread, place it in a rock, pour out the broth. And Gideon did so with the tip of the staff that was in his hand. The angel of the Lord touched the meat of the unleavened bread. Fire f- flared from the rock, consuming the meat. And it said, and and it consumed the meat and the bread. And the angel of the Lord disappeared. When Gideon realized that it was an angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Ah, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord's face. But the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid. You are not going to die. Here's something else the Lord showed me this week. In any area of our life that we have fear and anxiety, it's an area that's just screaming that we don't trust God. It's an area that we have an idol other than God in that place. I'm going to start with one because I'm going to, talk, I'm going to start about money first. I'll just warn you. I'm starting to talk, talk to you about money. Not because we need anything at this church. This church is completely paid off. I'm not begging for nothing. Our church is doing good. But what I'm telling you today is for you, not for us. But here's the thing, tithing. The Bible says that God gives us everything we make, everything we earn, everything we have, everything we possess comes from the Lord. The Lord owns the earth and the fullness thereof. So God owns it all. So 100% of your check, whenever you get it, belongs to God. God says you can keep 90% of that as long as you'll give 10% of that to me as a recognition that I gave you the whole thing. That I'm the one that gave that. I'm the author and the finisher of your, of your supplies, of what you have, what you, you have. And so when you think of it that way, the only reason you would not really want to tithe is because you don't trust God to bless the 90% to do more than the 100% would do. I believe 90% is more than enough with God's hand and his blessing upon it than 100% where I've got it all me and God's blessings not upon it. So the fear and anxiety, and you know, I was taught to pay tithes when you got a choice, you pay the tithes or you pay the electric bill. I have literally paid tithes instead of the electric bill. I'm the guy that has got out of my car, broke, and I stepped out of my car, the wind blew it and up money hit the side of my foot and I said, thank you, Lord. I've seen God work so many times when we were traveling, so many times we traveled, you, you would, one time I drove to a meeting in Miami, Florida, had, did not, it was a camp, it was a donated time, I was donating my free time, I drove there, my, I had enough gas to get there, me and my wife, I had no gas, I had no gas, no money, I was not promised any money at that thing, they, it was not something they pay people for, I was going and ministering in an all black camp in Miami, Florida, and I went there, and so when it was over, I didn't know if I was going to be thumbing a ride or out there begging by the bridge somewhere or entering to the interstate. The last day there, when I was fixing to leave, this person walked up and gave us enough money, and it was enough to get back home. I flew one time to uh, South Dakota, doing a ministry there, and uh, we, it, it, we took money that we had to go do that ministry there that we needed to pay our house payment and our electric and all that, and I got there, and the money wouldn't even really hardly pay for our flight. And on the very last day, we went. they took us to the airport. And this little old lady, me and Sharon, said, well, it looks like the Lord maybe didn't answer this time. Maybe something else, God's got something else planned. There's this little old lady walking down the, old lady walking down the, and she got this little round bucket, what they have ice cream in it. It's a bucket that had little cows on the outside of it. And she was bringing this, and like, there's that lady from the church. And it was back then, you didn't have to go through so many gates and all that stuff, and it was a little airport, so she's bringing it, and she gives it to us. And she said, I cooked you a few brownies and stuff, some stuff to eat on the airplane, and I put you a little card in there. And we hugged her neck, she left, and we were sitting there. We opened that little thing. There was some brownies and some goodies in there, which I loved. 
but there's an envelope, and it was enough money to pay all our bills. Me and Sharon just sat there and cried, God has come through again. We don't like to be put in those places where we, we have to trust and we have to have faith, but we're coming back around to a time that's exactly where God's going to put you. God's going to show himself strong in your weakness. That's just the way he's going to do it, and if, if you're going to be used of God, that's the way it's going to be. Some things happening right here at the church this week, and I've been praying for it to happen in a way in a long time. You know, I've seen our staff cry more in the last year than I've seen in all the years of my ministry. Things happen, attacks, different things come against. And uh, well, Monday we have our staff meeting. And I'm telling you, the Spirit of God just rose up. And it's like, it like our staff said, well, we're not putting up with this no more. We're going to settle this. We're going to settle that. We're going to do that. And I just kind of sat back and just listened. And I could just see faith growing. And I could see, not just faith, it's a determination. It was like some mama bears. Uh, it, was, it was something happening. And then like the next day or two, they were talking about the, uh, the, our, our team that's now taking, you know, that's managing our church management team. They're talking about, and they're going to go up and they're going to remodel the whole upstairs and they started on a little place there. They're going to take down that middle wall. They're going to put all new, you know, putting all kind of different things in, projectors. And where when it shines on Sunday morning, it'll all be children. It'll look like a big, giant children, wonderful experience. You know, like we got all this projection stuff here. It'll be all in there and it'll be a little like the most wonderful place for children to go to. But then on Wednesday, it all changes with these projectors and it's the most wonderful youth thing you've ever seen. And, and I thought, man, that's a great idea. That's amazing. And they go, we're excited about it. Can we do it? And I say, go for it. And they're already going for it. And they're going to be asking for some of you to help. I hope you'll go help. I hope you'll be a part of the energy that God's putting in this place. But it's like, God can't do that, but he can do that. God will do that. God's going to do some great things around here, but I'm seeing once again, we've got to, we got to do some things. One thing that Gideon, I'm going to paraphrase here. One thing that Gideon done after, you know, God said, well, you know, God, if you're with me and you, you showed me you're with me. So Gideon started getting up and doing what he knew needed to be done. So first he, he built an altar to the God. And he went back to praying and seeking God. He built an altar to God. Then God said, well, the next thing, you've got to tear down your idols. An idol is anything in your life that stands in the way of you trusting and believing in God. An idol, you can tell your idols by your insecurities. If you're afraid and fearful, that tells you right there there's an idol there. You know, there's an idol there. Uh, God had to deal with my fear of getting in front of people. They say that there's, you know, the greatest fear that people feared uh, public speaking more than they feared uh, death itself. So, you know, when I'm speaking at a funeral, the only people more, you know, I'm more afraid than the guy that's dead. And but see, that's the way God looks at this. And so God's going to take your areas of your vulnerable. You take in the uh, Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve sinned against God. They disobeyed God. And when they disobeyed God, they felt naked. They were naked and afraid. First time you hear of anything about being afraid. And so I'm starting to see here's how the enemy works. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Well, he wants to make you feel vulnerable. He wants to make you to feel like you're inadequate, that you're no good, that you can't do it. And even when you disappoint God... And we do many times. I do every week. He wants you to say, well, God don't love you anymore. And, you know, God ain't going to answer your prayers anymore. That's not true. God said that I have a heavenly father. I've, Jesus is at the right hand of the father. And he understands. And he's praying for us. It's just the, if we consistently sin over and over like this was for seven years, God will withdraw and let the enemy have his way in order not to put us down, but to turn us around back to him. We've got to understand the ways of God. Everything God does is good. And the thing is, when the devil comes at you, he's going to question what? God's goodness. He did it in the, in, in the Garden of Eden. He questioned, well, you know, if God was really good, he'd let you eat this fruit. But, you know, God's holding out on you. Every time we mess up is we are questioning the goodness of God. We're questioning whether God is with us. We're questioning whether God is on our side. That's all just the trick of the devil.
Adam and Eve sinned, though. When they sinned, they, they felt the nakedness. They felt the, they were vulnerable. They hid from God, like the children of Israel were hid, hiding from God. You find yourself hiding out. You find yourself fearful. You found yourself with anxiety. You need to question, where have I messed up and what other gods have taken their place in my life? And so God seeing Adam and Eve's their fear, what did he do? He got a lamb and he killed this lamb. And he took the lamb and uh, he took the skin of the lamb and he took and he made them clothes because the, uh, the, the little fig leaves were not going to work. They were not going to cover man. It was always going to be still feeling naked and afraid. And so he killed and he made a, a lamb skin and he covered their nakedness. Now, here's what happens. You ever see anybody, they go through a divorce? It's, it's funny to almost watch on Facebook. It's like, uh, well, they get on Facebook, and I'm doing so good. I, I dropped 180 dead pounds when I got rid of my husband. And next thing, they're dressing different, and they're talking about how wonderful their new boyfriend is or how wonderful their new girlfriend is. And they start doing all this crazy, it, it looks crazy online, doesn't it? You see it and you're looking at it. And what it is, they're posturing and they're covering the areas they, they, feel, they feel vulnerable in. They're trying to make up for their loss. And it's, it's almost laughable. But we all do it. You take someone, you know, if we don't honor God with our finances pretty soon, we're trying to look like we're more wealthy than we are. We got it made. And really, people don't know, you know, we're trying to keep up with the Joneses. And we don't even know the Joneses are broke themselves. You know? If we're not careful, the enemy puts us in these games where we're trying to make ourselves something that we're not. But our greatest point is when we just recognize, okay, yeah, uh, okay, I've been bankrupt. But that's not me anymore. That's what I used to be. See, when you hear the voice of Satan, he's come to put you down. When you, the voice of the Holy Spirit is there to lift you up. God allows, you know, you'd say bad things to happen to you. He allows it to happen to you, not to put you down, but to turn you around. That's the loving nature of God. So we find in the story of Gideon, and I'll need to just hurry up and, and paraphrase, but he finds out that God is with him, and then he tells God, he said, well, God, I want to, I want to, I want to make sure it, I want to make sure, God, that you're with me. God, I, ju I just got to know, because he's already hearing the devil. Well, he's not with you. You're going to get your butt kicked. And, uh, and so God began to call Jacob, uh, uh, Gideon, give him a new name. And Gideon's new name means bell butt whooper. Yeah. Look it up. Bell, you know, that's what it meant. So now he's already, and he, the angel called him man of mighty, you know, mighty man of valor. Gideon, who, me? And Gideon still hadn't got it in his spirit yet that God was going to use him. So he took, and he took this fleece and he put it before the Lord. And it was a, a, a goat skin. And he said, Lord, if you're really, really, really with me, I got to know. I want tonight the dew to fall, and I may have it backwards, but if the dew falls... I want just the lambskin to be wet and everything else around it to be dry. He gets up the next morning and he gets there and the lambskin, he just wrings water out of it and the ground is dry. He goes, well, Lord, one more thing. Lord, don't get angry with me. In verse 39, you'll, he'll say, God, don't be angry for me doing this, but I just got to know, I got to know that you're with me. I just got to know you're with me, God. And he laid it out again. He said, Lord, let's just reverse that. That may have been too easy. Lord, in the morning, if you're really, really going, if you want me to go in, into this battle, if you're really, really with me, God, let it be dry and everything else around it be wet. He gets up the next morning and the skin is completely dry. The ground is wet. He said, okay, God, me and you. See, you and the Lord's all you need. Me and you, Lord. He says, I want you to get your men down, your 3,200 men, 32,000 men, I guess it was. I want you to get them down there. And he said, tell all your men, if you're afraid and fearful, go home. 
So probably Gideon was headed, and God said, no, not you, Gideon. You're not to go home. You stay. And so Gideon, he stays, and 10,000 people leave. And you already heard that the Midianites and the Amorites, their men was so many, you couldn't count their camels, you couldn't count their donkeys, you couldn't count the massive army they had. But now Gideon's army has already lost 10,000. He said, uh, Gideon, I want you to go down and take them down to the river there and have them drink water. And if they take the water and lap it out of their hands like a dog, I want you to, uh, I want you to, as you see it happening, tell them to go over here. And so when Gideon got to, there was 300 people that lapped the water out of their hands like a dog. He put them over there. He said, the rest of you can go home. Now Gideon's only got 300 people against this massive army. He said, Gideon, that's to do. And if you listen to the, the scripture, it, God says, Gideon, I do not want to fight this battle with you having 32,000 men. Least y'all win, because you're going to win. Least you win and you take the glory for it. And least you don't understand that I did this thing for you. And so he got rid now he's down to 300 men. Now everybody's going to know if Gideon wins, it's got to be the Lord. See, we question that. You've probably heard me tell this little story about this bird. He would not listen. He would not listen. They told him, you need to fly south for the winter. You need to fly south for the winter. And the little bird wouldn't do it. And so the winter came, and about the time, yeah, I need to go south for the winter. And he tried to fly, and the, his wings began to freeze up, and he hit the ground. And a barn, this farmer saw the little birdie, and he grabbed the birdie, and he saw a fresh cow manure. He didn't have time to mess with him, so he just stuck the little birdie in some fresh cow manure. And the bird started chirping and chirping and singing. And a cat come along and pulled the little birdie out and killed the birdie. I want to give you a, a few lessons from this story here. One, the person that puts you in a mess is not always your enemy. Or allows you, maybe God. God may be allowing something in your life right now because he's not put it there to put you down but turn you around second thing is the person that takes you out of a mess may not be your friend like hello uh, I can take all of your debt and I can put it all together into one I can get you out of debt tomorrow that may not be from God see the person that takes you out of a mess may not be your friend the third thing when you're up to your neck and mess you may need to just shut your little chirper <laughs> And a fourth and bonus lesson is cats are evil. <laughs> I just say uh, cats are evil. And so we bring this back. They're licking water out of their hands like a dog. Some people say, is there something significant about that? Well, not really. Does that mean God loves dogs more than cats? Well, that's you don't even have to answer that question. That's obvious in our society. But here's the thing. This story is amazing. And, and this week, with all that was going on here, something got a hold of me. And all, you know, he had to have an angel. He had to have a word, a prophet. He had to have an angel. He had to have uh, that meal that the flame came up and took it. He had to have two times, there had to have something special happen to the fleece. And every time what he was wanting to know, is God really with me? And if you would be honest, there's not, there's not anything you wouldn't attempt for God if you knew that he was with you. There's not anything you would not believe that God could do if you knew he was with you. I got to thinking about that, and if if how how can how could we get through to people that God is with you, God is with you? How can God get through to our society that I am with you, I am with you, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I am God, I'm with you. I even saw you in your sin, and I came to you and rescued you. I love you, and you read in Paul, what can separate us from the love of God? Nothing can separate us from the love of God. And I got to thinking that. One time, the Lamb of God came and he died 
on the cross. And when we look to the cross and we look to the Lamb of God, it, he started off as a covering for our sin and our shame. And today there's a cross stands. You see them all over the place at churches. People wear them around their neck. It stands to let us know God will never give up on us, that he loves us. He loves us. He loves us. He's going to keep loving us. He's going to be there. His name, when he came, the angel said, his name shall be called Emmanuel, meaning God is with us. The one thing that we need to know, the one thing we need to be convinced of, he's telling it, he's screaming it with all his might. His name is Emmanuel. I am God. I'm with you. The cross is saying, I'm with you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I want you to come to me. I want you to bring all your troubles to me. I want you to bring all your anxiety to me. I want you to bring all your fear to me. I can have it all. I'm a God and I am definitely 100% with you. Don't doubt me. Don't doubt me. And that's what I'm asking you to do today is trust that God is with you and start tackling some of the enemies in your life that's causing you hurt and harm. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you today for your word. God, any area that we're fearful and have anxiety, Lord, we need to kick those idols out. We need to quit believing that we're not adequate. We need to quit believing that, that God somehow is not adequate for our battles. We need to become like mama bears and we need to get between our loved ones and Satan and saying, no more Satan. You're not going to attack my family anymore. You're not going to attack my children anymore. God, you're not going to do this anymore. I'm going to stand between you and that, that enemy. He says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So God, I know there's some hurting people in here today that they've got loved ones that need saving, need healing, need deliverance, need financial help, need relationship helps. God, I want them to know and believe in their heart and know it for a reality that God is with them and God will help them get through that if they'll just turn their heart toward him today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.